welcome everyone to the 35th episode of the podcast. Today I'll be covering the kingdom Animalia, which is a huge and complex kingdom closely related to the fungi. Both animals and fungus are part of the clade Opisthocanta, which is one of the major subgroups of the protus. But the animals and fungus are categorized as their own groups, their own kingdoms, because they're quite distinct in many ways, genetically, chemically, physiologically, and so on. The animals are the kingdom that I'm going to be exploring today. This is going to be a fun episode, because animals are simultaneously some of the most exotic and familiar organisms on the planet. You are an animal, as is everyone you know. Animals live in the sea, on the ground, they fly in the air, and with a little help from rocket technology, they've even been in space. Understand that the story of animal evolution is also the story of our evolution, of how humans came to be. The story of animals largely begins with an event called the Cambrian Explosion, which began around 550 million years ago, and it lasted for around 20 to 25 million years. This event was like a veritable blossoming of life, where every single major animal phyla and body plan appeared, including arthropods, mollusks, echinoderms, chordates, and a number of various phyla of worms. The Earth had been dominated by single-celled organisms and microbial colonies for billions of years, but the Cambrian explosion saw the rapid proliferation of multicellular organisms, with their own increasingly complex body systems. Sometime before, bacteria and archaea had fused to create the first eukaryote, you know, the first protus, and these diversified into numerous clades. One of these clades was the Opisthocanta, which includes the fungus that I talked about in the previous episode, a protus lineage called the Coenoflagellates, and lastly, the animals. First, the basics. The most fundamental description of animals is that they're mobile heterotrophs, multicellular organisms that eat other organisms, able to move around under their own power. Functionally speaking, all animals have some kind of muscle cell that contorts and moves their body, as well as some kind of neural cell that sends signals to other cells. I should mention that sea sponges are the only exception to this, because they don't have nerves, muscles, organs, or really any kind of serious cellular specialization. However, sponges are considered animals because they are multicellular heterotrophs that produce sperm cells, and they don't have cell walls. Pretty much all animal cells don't possess a cell wall. This means that animal cells are soft and plastic. They're able to bend and stretch, and they exist within some kind of extracellular matrix, like bone or blood or cartilage. So fundamentally, animals are multicellular, mobile, chemical superstructures that eat nonstop, and they're able to move easily to acquire more food. This approach to life allows animals to consume tremendous amounts of nutrients and chemical resources, and that enables them to grow really big, to grow, they grow really large. Where trees can grow tall because of the chemical lignin and the structural support that it provides, animals grow large because their mobility gives them access to an order of magnitude more nutrients. In all ecosystems, animals are the primary consumers of biomatter. They're the primary movers of chemical energy across the food chain. The first multicellular animal was a sponge, from the phylum periphera, which includes animals that filter feed through a network of pores in their bodies. Sponges had existed for more than 50 million years before the Cambrian explosion, and their genetics and life strategy are really similar to the coenoflagellate protists that share a common ancestor with animals, which suggests that they were the first diverging lineage from the protists, or in other words, the sponges were the first in a lineage that would become the animals. It's believed that at some point, a lineage of sponges evolved a little more complexity and eventually detached from the ocean floor entirely, becoming mobile, swimming organisms called the tenophora, or the comb jellies. These comb jellies have simple bodies, composed of an outer layer defining their body shape, and an inner layer defining their digestive cavity. Their bodies are lined with rows of cilia, and they rhythmically pulsate these cilia in order to move and swim through the water. 
The Tenophora were some of the first animals to evolve true nerve cells, but these don't really form any kind of centralized neural structure like a brain or a spine. Instead, their nerve cells form a decentralized mesh called a neural net. The decentralized structure of their nervous system is a trait that the Tenophores share with the Nidaria, which are the next major divergence in the animal lineage. The Nidaria include the sea anemones, the corals, and the jellyfish, all organisms that possess a specific cell type called a nidocyte. The nidocyte is a rod or bulb-shaped cell that literally explodes outwards in such a way so as to propel a small amount of toxin into another organism. The Nidaria use these weaponized cells to deliver stings and paralyzing toxins, and this comes in handy when they're trying to capture and eat prey or defending themselves from predators. These nidocytes are present on the tentacles surrounding the nidarian's mouth, like the long tentacles on a jellyfish, or uh, the thick, stubby tentacles on a sea anemone. Both the tenophora and the nidaria are diploblast animals. This means that their body tissues are derived from an embryo that begins with just two distinct tissue types. These are the ectoderm, which covers the outside of the organism, and the endoderm, which lines the inside. For those two phyla, the ectoderm forms the soft skin that contains the jelly-like substance within their bodies, while the endoderm becomes the inner layer, defining the digestive cavity and holding in the jelly from the inside. From the phylum nidaria diverged a relatively small phylum called the acela, or the acelomate worms. These worms shared traits like a decentralized neural net with their jellyfish and comb jelly ancestors, but they also possessed some evolutionary adaptations that would enable the development of larger, more complex life. The first important adaptation in the acela was triploblasty instead of diploblasty, and this was the emergence of a third layer of germ cells in the embryo, and the third layer was called the mesoderm. This mesoderm creates the specialized cells like muscles, vasculature, organs, and other stuff that exists between the ectoderm and the endoderm. The second important adaptation was the shift from radial symmetry to bilateral symmetry. Where the jellyfish had a radial symmetry like a bicycle wheel or a clock, the acela had a bilateral symmetry defined by a plane running down the length of their bodies, and this divided them into mere halves. This bilateral symmetry is the defining feature of all animal life that diverged beyond the acela, like the flatworms, the snails and squid, insects, fish, and everything else. Okay, so let's recap what's evolved so far. The first animals were sponges, which are believed to have existed as long as 700 billion years ago. These organisms were the first truly multicellular creatures, distinct from the colonial bacteria mats and amalgamations of protist cells. These sponges were sessile, immobile, locked to the ocean floor. But around 515 million years ago, a lineage of sponges diverged into the comb jellies, which were mobile organisms detached from the ocean floor that could swim around and search for their food instead of waiting for their food to just be filtered through them. The Tenophora comb jellies had rudimentary neural cells, organized into a loose, mesh-like network that permeated their bodies. Several million years later, the Phylonidaria diverged from the Tenophora, showing a more developed neural system and a more organized radial symmetry. From these jellyfish and sea anemones diverged the acela, the acelomate worms, which also shared the decentralized neural net. But the acelomate worms possessed a more bilateral symmetry and a triploblast germ layer called a mesoderm. In the evolutionary record, we're now around 500 to 450 million years ago. We're barely out of the Cambrian explosion, and we're about to witness the emergence of the triploblast bilaterians, a lineage of organisms with bilateral symmetry and an embryo with three differentiating layers of germ cells. The triploblast bilaterians are a huge group of animals, including virtually all animal life more complex than a jellyfish or an acelomate worm. Let's examine the name a little more, you know, acelomate worms. These are from the phylum acela, which literally means that they lack a coelom. Now this just raises another question, what's a coelom? 
Well, it's just one of the more important evolutionary emergences in the history of life. Consider all of the diploblast organisms like sponges and comb jellies and jellyfish. These organisms have two germ layers in their embryo, and these developed into the inner lining of the digestive tract and the outer layer of the skin with the uh, nerves in the neural net. In diploblasts, these layers or linings are just attached to one another, or they have some kind of inorganic substance like a, a jelly material, like in jellyfish, just between the layers, and this makes the organisms take on a bag-like shape. Their bodies are just thin carbon fabric bags, which take in and excrete nutrients from the same opening. Triploblasts, in contrast, have that third germ layer called a mesoderm, and it's positioned between the ectoderm and the endoderm. In the jellyfish and sponges, their inner and outer tissue layers are directly connected, or sometimes you know, have the jelly in between them. But in bilaterians, the mesoderm separates them, and in organisms with the coelom, the mesoderm itself contains pockets, or cavities. In coelomates, which are organisms with a, a true coelom, the mesoderm completely lines these cavities. I know that this explanation is a little abstract, so consider it in real terms. Consider your body. The ectoderm germ cells in your embryo developed into your skin and your nerves. Your endoderm germ cells developed into your stomach and your intestines and your esophagus. Your mesoderm forms the stuff in between those two layers, between your skin and your stomach. Your mesoderm develops into your muscles and your organs and your bones. The evolution of the coelom was really important because it created a fluid-filled cavity within the body. This space could now easily transport nutrients from one end of the body to the other. It provided a space for organs, but most fundamentally, it turned soft-bodied creatures into pressurized capsules. With the internal pressure of liquid that was held in the coelom, the soft-bodied organisms enjoyed a kind of a, a kind of turgidity, and this acted like a skeleton. It's called a, a hydrostatic skeleton. It's like the difference between deflated and inflated balloons, or like between an empty and a full water balloon. The water balloon has a stiffer surface that can apply greater pressure against the environment. In the case of the first coelomate organisms, this greatly enhanced their mobility. And when you can move quickly, you can find food more often. You can take in more nutrients, more chemical energy. You grow larger, and you reproduce more often. The coelom was also associated with two other important evolutionary adaptations. The decentralized neural net that was present in the comb jellies and the jellyfish, it coalesced into a centralized nervous system with a primitive spinal cord. As an animal moved forward in the search for food, there was an evolutionary pressure for the nervous tissue at the front of the animal to become larger, with a greater density of nerves. In time, this increasing concentration of nerves became a primitive brain in a, a kind of like a pseudo-face although at the time it would have been little more than a fleshy nodule called a cerebral ganglia buried inside the end of a fleshy stub that's more or less the head. The development of a brain was part and parcel with the second major adaptation, which was the development of a head. This process was called cephalization. To put it simply, the bilaterian animals began to develop distinct head and body structures. At one end of the organism was a highly sensitive head that searched out and consumed food, and attached behind it was a body evolving greater and greater mobility. The head and its dense nerve tissue detected stuff like food or danger or a mate, and the head sends signals to the rest of the body. These signals are used to animate the body in such a way as to propel the head forward through the environment. This is an important phenomenon to understand. Animals are very large chemical machines whose bodies are designed for two things. Roaming around and looking for food, and eating that food. This is why pretty much all bilaterian species, from snakes, fish, and octopus, to cows, birds, and humans, they all have heads on their front, or their top side, facing forward, with a body replete with limbs that can transport the animal. The fins of a fish help propel and direct it through the water, as do the arms and the webbing of an octopus. Birds can walk around on their feet, but their upper limbs are their primary means of locomotion, 
as they use their wings to maneuver through the air. Before I get too far into the way animals move and eat, let me return to the subject of evolutionary history. We're at a point now where the bilaterian animals have three germ layers in their embryos, which is where the next major divergence would emerge. Two general mechanisms for embryological development appeared, and this divided the animals into two groups, the protostomes and the deuterostomes. Okay, so you should understand that the embryo is basically a spherical clump of cells, and these cells are rapidly reproducing. The cells in each germ layer, and a germ layer is just a, a layer of specialized cells within the embryo, this layer starts to develop into the layers of the body, but the way it does so differs between the two groups. The endoderm bubbles into the outer layer of the embryo, and this creates a hole. And this hole is either the exit or the entrance of the digestive tract, or the inner boundary layer of the animal that lines the internal cavity that's used to digest and then excrete food. In protostomes, the endoderm pore creates the mouth first, and then the anus at the other end of the digestive tract. But in deuterosomes, this happens in reverse. The anus forms first, and then the mouth forms. There's also a difference in how the mesoderm develops into the internal organs and the muscle tissue, or whatever analogs that the animals like insects, squid, and worms have. In protostomes, the mesoderm starts at first as a solid mass of cells. But these cells hollow out from the inside to create an internal pocket, or a bubble, and this bubble is entirely lined with mesoderm. There's mesoderm cells completely encapsulating this cavity. The deuterosomes, on the other hand, have a mesoderm cell layer that's in contact with the endoderm during early development. And as the embryo develops, the mesoderm cells expand like bubbles, and they bud off of the endoderm. This process creates an empty internal space called the coelom, and it's also lined with mesoderm. Both protostomes and deuterosomes have the same end goal during embryological development, which is to make a coelom entirely lined with mesoderm. They just have a different way of doing it. Evolutionarily, the protostomes would go on to evolve into organisms like flatworms, roundworms, earthworms, squid, snails, slugs, and every insect, arachnid, and crustacean on the planet. The deuterosomes, on the other hand, would diverge into the starfish and other related seafloor-dwelling species like the sand dollar and the sea cucumber, as well as all the animals with a vertebral column, like the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. I'll be covering all of these groups and more in future episodes. As I've already discussed, the protostomes and deuterosomes had a common ancestor with a coelom, a centralized nervous system that formed a rudimentary brain and the emergence of a front-back body structure replete with a rudimentary head. But beyond this, the protostomes and the deuterosomes diverged entirely, their lineages growing and diversifying through time. The protostome group called the platyhelminthes, or just the flatworms, they actually lost their coelom as their mesoderm gradually evolved smaller and smaller internal cavities, until, eventually, no cavities formed at all, and the mesoderm was more or less a solid block of cells again. In other groups, the mature adult body shape evolved again a kind of full or partial radial symmetry, like the deuterosome starfish in the phylum Echinodermata, or some species in the mollusk phylum, like squid and octopus. Three bilaterian phyla independently evolved segmented bodies, or some kind of physical segmentation. The annelids are one such phyla, as their name literally means segmented worms. The other phyla that evolved segmentation are the arthropods and the chordates, so pretty much all the insects, crustaceans, and vertebrates. Segmentation involves the presence of repeating structures or subunits in the body. The bones in your spine are an example of segmentation, as are the body and jointed limbs of a spider, a crab, or a dragonfly. If you listen to the episodes in my playlist on genetics, you might recall that genes are often expressed in groups. Each gene produces an enzyme, or part of an enzyme, and these work in tandem with a large group of other enzymes in order to perform some greater function or utility for some other purpose. You can think of these enzymes and the genes that code for them kind of like the tools in a toolkit. 
The tools you have in a given toolkit will vary depending on the job at hand. A carpenter's toolkit will contain stuff like a hammer, nails, a ruler, a level, that kind of thing. While a road worker would have similar but slightly different tools, like a ruler and a level, but a flat striker bar instead of nails, or a proctor hammer instead of a hammer used for pounding in nails. Likewise, if you had a carpenter who was working on a small project, he would have relatively small tools meant to handle the finesse of that small project. But if he was working on something larger, like a house, he would have larger tools, like big power tools, and maybe even vehicle-mounted tools to help build the foundation. The point I'm trying to make here is that, in much the same way, groups of genes that code for enzymes that need to work together are typically all expressed at the same time, and they have slight variations for specific purposes. These gene groups are like a toolkit, and they print out enzymes that perform specific functions. If there are small changes in the genes being expressed down the lengths of the animal's body, like slightly different tools being used in the toolkit, then the animal will develop differences in the size, shape, and even the number of its limbs, as well as the segmentation in its body structure. Therefore, segmentation is like a product of a streamlined system of genetic expression, which modifies genes as needed to create the animal's anatomy. Your thumb and your other fingers are very similar structures, but they obviously have their differences. All of your fingers are slightly different sizes, and the thumb is definitely shorter, it has one less joint, and it's positioned at a different angle than the other fingers. But the genes that produced both your thumbs and the rest of your fingers were very similar, with only slight modifications in their gene expression. Those modifications are the result of evolution, shaping our physiology, and they're responsible for the anatomical and physiological differences that I mentioned earlier. Similarly, segmentation and a slight variable gene expression occurs in your finger bones, which get smaller as they reach your fingertips, or your vertebra, which get larger as they go down from cervical to lumbar. It's also why some animals have multiple pairs of legs, with one pair often much larger than the others, like the jumping legs on a grasshopper or a frog, or like the claws on a crab or a scorpion. Okay, so now that I've touched on the major parts of animal evolution, let's explore what behavioral motives and selection pressures were behind all this rapid diversification. I've established that animals are eating machines, basically just massive chemical structures that move and eat. So how have they evolved to move, and how have they evolved to eat? Well, Movement is achieved by moving limbs in coordinated patterns, or in coordinated ways, which propels the head and the body through the environment, be it water, air, or dry land. In all animals, the limb develops as a stub, or a little outgrowth of cells from the main body. A gene called DLL is heavily expressed in this limb nub, and DLL directs the growth of the cell outwards, extending the limb from the developing body. Some animals have little more than these rudimentary stubs or lobes, which they use to crawl around. Other animals have tentacles, while others have jointed limbs. You're probably most familiar with jointed limbs, as not only do you have them, but all other vertebrates and all the arthropods also have jointed limbs. We use our jointed limbs to move, to walk and run and jump, or to climb and swing through trees. Humans use their jointed arms and hands to throw spears and carve up the meat from the animals they hunted, and today we use them to type on computers and tap at our phone screens. Speaking of eating meat, that's a pretty convenient transition into the methods that animals use to eat. You're probably very familiar with what animals eat, like carnivores and herbivores. You know, carnivores are predatory animals that eat other animals, and then there's the less dangerous herbivores that eat plants. And you also have the detrivores, that eat from the dead and decaying organic matter. Some animals are able to eat both plants and the meat from other animals, and these are called omnivores, and they include some species of bears, ants, birds, and of course humans, and most of our primate cousins. It's important to understand that what an animal eats plays a huge role in the ecology, the ecology is the net sum of the plant and animal interactions, 
and how those interactions move resources and nutrients through space. The food chain, for example, is a very simple ecological diagram, showing plants on the bottom as the primary producers, which get eaten by the herbivores. The plants turn light energy from the sun into chemical energy in the form of biomolecules, and so when the herbivores eat the plants, they eat those biomolecules, and they harvest a portion of the total chemical energy in the plant. When predators then come in and capture an herbivore, they eat the herbivore, and the chemical energy in the herbivore's body gets digested by the predator, and the predator thus harvests a portion of that chemical energy. This is chemical energy moving up the food chain, but you'll notice that there's less and less and less as it goes up, and this is because not all of the energy from a chemical is able to be extracted during digestion. Because of the reduced amount of the chemical energy available in a stable ecosystem, predator populations are usually much smaller than prey populations. When there's no predators, the population of prey animals, or the herbivores or whatever, the population generally skyrockets. They breed like crazy. The swollen population eats all of their available food. And when all the food is gone, the swollen population begins to starve. Meanwhile, predator populations will also swell as their prey increases in number. But when the prey start to starve because they ate all of the available plants, the huge predator population also starts to run out of food, and they also experience starvation. In this way, the population sizes of associate prey and predator species will often go through a cycle. You'll have the growth and decline of a prey population, and following at a slight delay behind it is the growth and decline of the predator population. Okay, so that's what animals eat, but how do they eat? Conveniently enough, there are four primary feeding strategies that animals use. Filter feeding, deposit feeding, those who consume fluids, like fluid feeding, and those who consume raw chunks of flesh, which is called mass feeding. The group of filter-feeding animals is hugely diverse, and it includes the small and stationary sponges, which filter food particles out of the water, and it includes baleen whales, which take in a huge mouthful of water and squeeze it out, filtering out the water through its baleen teeth, but capturing the plankton and krill in the water for food. The deposit feeders aren't as diverse, as they're usually some kind of worm or worm-like shape. The deposit feeders, they dig through the substrate, be it the sand on the seafloor or the dirt on dry land, and they digest organic particulates and microbes and other ground-dwelling organisms that they happen to ingest. The fluid feeders are like the opposite of filter feeders. Where the filter feeders indiscriminately take in a huge amount of water and filter it out for a bit of food, the fluid feeders typically use a thin proboscis to siphon up a liquid. Butterflies and hummingbirds, for example, are fluid feeders that get their nectar from deep inside a flower. Other fluid feeders include bats and parasites that consume blood, stealing digested nutrients straight out of another organism's body. The fourth feeding strategy is called mass feeding, and it literally involves an animal just taking a mass of food into its mouth and processing it into a digestible format usually through chewing with the teeth and chemical softening with saliva. The mass feeders include animals like cows, deers, wolves, lions, and us humans. On a side note, recognize that all of these animals have evolved teeth shaped by evolution to specialize in consuming what they eat. Herbivores have broad, flat teeth and a lateral chewing motion that grinds up leaves. Carnivores have sharp teeth that slash and tear at flesh. The last thing that I want to cover today is perhaps the most fundamental. Animals may be the only organisms that move around to seek out food, but everything, everything that's alive, needs to reproduce, and animals are obviously no exception. The purpose of the organism moving is to find food to eat, and the whole purpose of eating is to stay alive and grow big and healthy. The point of growing big and healthy from an evolutionary perspective is to increase your chances at having sex, at reproducing, and passing on your genes. Some animals are asexual, like the corals, and they reproduce by forming little polyps that bud off of the parent's body and it just grows into a new individual. Asexual reproduction is relatively efficient because it just requires one individual, 
and if the reproductive process isn't fatal, that individual can reproduce on their own, over and over again. But this asexual individual is only producing clones, and the big population of clones has very little genetic diversity. Low genetic diversity makes the asexual populations vulnerable to diseases and other large-scale threats. Sexual reproduction evolved to solve this problem, as sexual reproduction involves the mixing of two individuals' genomes into an offspring with new combinations of alleles, and thus novel genetic variety. Sexual reproduction can be either internal or external, referencing where the fertilization takes place. Animals like fish and sea cucumbers, they use external fertilization, where they spray their eggs and sperm into the water. The sperm fertilizes the eggs, and the embryo develops outside the body of either parent. With internal fertilization, the male's sperm is deposited through a variety of ways into the female's body, where it fertilizes the eggs. Once the egg inside the female's body has been fertilized, there are several ways the embryo can develop, but this depends on the species. Viviparous animals, they grow the embryo inside their bodies, nourishing it with their own blood, until they give birth to live young. Humans are viviparous, as are cats and dogs and most other mammal species. On the other hand, there are oviparous species, which remove the embryo after fertilization. The embryo is grown inside a protective sac called an egg, and it's deposited somewhere outside of the parent's body. Insects lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves, or in a piece of fruit, or even inside the body of another animal. Reptiles lay eggs that they often bury in sand or dirt, and birds will lay eggs that they keep in protective nests. There are also things called ovoviviparous species, which are a strange combination of both, retaining their eggs internally, but giving birth to live young. These offspring will go through a life cycle, maturing through adolescence until they reach adulthood, where they reproduce and have offspring of their own. Some species die immediately after reproduction, but others can live on and have more offspring before they die. Those offspring grow, reproduce, and die, and their offspring grow, reproduce, and die, and on and on through time. And this is how genes and alleles and entire species are propagated through millions of years. All right, so that's all I have for you for today. If you want to hear more stuff about animals, just know that I'll be creating future series on both the protostomes and the deuterosomes. In these episodes, we'll explore their evolution and physiology in much greater detail. If you enjoyed this episode, please send the show some love with a like, a share, or by subscribing and enjoying more of my weekly content. And as always, thanks for listening. the biologic podcast it's super easy when you open a new episode press the like button or share it with your friends if you aren't subscribed you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week you can also peruse our official store which has a ton of cool stuff like hand designed t-shirts hoodies and stickers all the links you need are in the description section below